you know, one of the best ways, one of the most constructive ways to, to make those contributions is to work on the apocryphal text. I'm Brent Landau. I teach uh, um, at the uh, University of Texas at Austin, so just up the road from here in San Antonio. Um, I teach uh, a range of classes there, a number of sort of big introdu introductory classes in, uh, in the religious studies, and among them I do teach a class in Christian Apocrypha every two years, which is really exciting for me to do. and. Uh, try and publish as much stuff as I can on that. I'm Tony Burke. I teach uh, Biblical Studies at York University in Toronto, Canada. And uh, when I'm not teaching Bible courses, I try to, as much as possible, throw in some Christian apocryphal texts to uh, get my students to understand that there's a wide range of other texts out there that early Christians were writing and reading than they may not already be aware of. The title of the new book is uh, New Testament Apocrypha, more non-canonical scriptures. And the, the sort of back, the backstory to that is that there have been a number of anthologies of Christian Apocrypha writings that were not included in the New Testament. Um, and some of these have gone through, you know, several, several editions. Um, but the the number of Christian apocryphal texts out there is quite large, and so uh, most of the standard anthologies have sort of a, I don't know, a, a kind of a set list or a most kind of popular collection of these texts that they, um, that they include, but a lot of stuff gets neglected, and in a number of cases these anthologies were published, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, so they haven't been updated with, say, new manuscript discoveries and, and things like that. So um, there had been an interest in doing a new anthology that had more of these texts in them, uh, the, more of these neglected texts. Uh, there was also an interest in um, sort of doing this as a product or a project that was based in North America because the uh, historically the centers of study for this literature have been um, in Europe and in the United Kingdom. And so this was in some ways, even though the contributors to the volume are international, the editors are based in, in North America and the critical mass of contributors is based in North America. So this was sort of a, a way to um, uh, really put the study of Christian Apocrypha in North America on the map. And then in terms of the Erdman's connection and why it got published with Erdman's, uh, uh, it was preceded by the uh, more Old Testament pseudepigrapha project uh, that James Davila um, and Richard Bauckham uh, were the editors for and are continuing to be the editors for. And so that was sort of the direct inspiration. I think most most of the people in our field now prefer to use the term Christian Apocrypha for the material because New Testament Apocrypha suggests that the material was all written around the same time as the formation of the New Testament, so in the first three centuries. And most previous, or the main previous collections focused on that material. And our field is moving towards look, broadening that, that scope of time and trying to look at a wider range of apocryphal literature. And um, we, ha we have a kind of an arbitrary cutoff date of around the 10th century. Um, uh, but uh, it's quite clear that people continue to write Apocrypha and transmit Apocrypha long after the uh, New Testament was formed. Um, so we end up, though, going with New Testament Apocrypha, despite it being a bit of a problematic title, because it's much more um, identifiable. Uh, people will understand that a little bit more than, than the notion of Christian Apocrypha. Um, so uh, in a way it was a bit of a concession to popular consciousness. Um, but it also has a pedigree, like it, it, the previous collections tend to have that title as well and, and be able to kind of make the connections with those other, other collections in that regard. Because it is meant to be kind of a supplemental collection to, to um, collections that have, that have appeared previously. Uh, in Intro to the New Testament, uh, 
uh, actually, I, I go over this on the very first day with, this, with the students, that I show them um, Luke's infancy narrative, so the story of the census um, uh, and the, uh, Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem for the census and there being no room in the inn and, and all of that. And then I say to the students, where's the donkey? Like, you know there's a donkey there, right? It's in all the Christmas pageants. Some poor kid always gets stuck, you know, being a donkey that sometimes somebody has to ride on top of. And it's not there. And I explained to them, well, this is, um, uh, this only appears for the first time, not in the New Testament, but in a second century infancy gospel called the Protovangelium of James or the Infancy Gospel of James. And from its inclusion there, it just, uh, shows up in other texts and eventually uh, shows up in artistic representation and now it's just become this very sort of fixed part of um, not only sort of church tradition and sort of an assumption that everybody knows about this um, uh, but you know just even broader popular culture so you know I think that a lot of people and perhaps a lot of Christians would want to say the canonical texts are, are special and distinctive and they're, they're you know, separate uh, and, and much greater in authority than the apocryphal texts. And in general, that may be correct, but there are also some really interesting examples uh, where the line between canonical and apocryphal is, is not as clear and is quite blurry and for me, the donkey is the best example of that. One thing that uh, many of us are turning to in our discipline is looking at the interplay between uh, Apocrypha and non-canonical and canonical texts throughout Christian history. And the texts in the volume communicate that quite well because we have texts that were written you know, as um, far after the canon was formed. And these texts were written in order to, uh, in a sense, invent Christianity. Um, they were written to establish festivals, they were written to provide a, a backstory to relics mm -hmm. or to uh, provide a backstory to the creation of a church. So the church continued to write these texts in order to establish itself in, in, uh, in the ancient world and then continue to, as it changed through time and, and uh, changed um, uh, ways of envisioning themselves in the world, they would write texts in order to, uh, to make it clear to, their, to readers and their followers how they fit. With Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, you got this idea that sort of uh, got uh, dispersed into popular culture of the apocryphal texts, uh, particularly the apocryphal gospels, being um, quite early. And I think at one point, uh, one of the characters in the Da Vinci Code says there was something like 40 gospels that were written in the first century and you know the church only chose four of them and they chose the ones that presented Jesus so, um, you know as um, you know the most divine being um, you know so there are um, there are lots of misconceptions of, of something like that um, I think it's important to keep in mind that despite the sensational claims about apocryphal literature and the importance of this literature for understanding early Christianity, there aren't that many apocryphal texts that we can say with any degree of confidence are as early as, say, the New Testament Gospels. The list of gospel texts that might have been composed about the same time as the canonical gospels is relatively small. You know, we're talking about the infancy, or not the infancy gospel of Thomas, we're talking about the gospel of Thomas, we're talking about um, maybe the gospel of Peter, um, maybe some of the uh, fragments of lost gospels that we have on papyrus. So in some ways, it's it, even though Dan Brown has done <laughs> enormous good, I think, for the study of the Christian Apocrypha by making um, people just generally in popular, popular culture interested in this. Um, I think it's important to, to also correct some of the misconceptions. Uh, but I would also say that 
we shouldn't just evaluate this literature, the merits of this literature on you know, how early it is and whether some of these writings are earlier than the New Testament Gospels themselves. Um, you know, those are interesting questions to explore, but they also just give us such a range of theological uh, diversity and, you know, kind of diversity among understandings of Jesus and, and all sorts of things that makes the sort of the landscape of early Christianity much broader than we find if we simply look at the canonical texts. The canonical texts are diverse among themselves. That should be emphasized too. Um, but, uh, but this just really broadens the, um, broadens the horizons. One of my favorite texts and a text I, I often actually open my Christian Apocrypha course with when I, uh, with my students is uh, the uh, life of John the Baptist, which is attributed to uh, a bishop named Serapion. And I like this text because it expands the story of John the Baptist's, um, um, well, it's his entire life, but it's particularly the scene where he dies. And in this scene, uh, his, he gets his head chopped off, as usual, as we know from the New Testament, and then his head flies off the platter and starts to continue to um, criticize uh, Herod and Herodias. Um, and the text says, uh, for 15 years, it, it flies around the city of Jerusalem, um, continuing, continuing to, uh, to criticize the king. And then eventually it falls down and uh, on the ground, and that's where they build a church. Um, but uh, when it comes to Christian Apocrypha, uh, maybe even any literature, you can't beat a flying head. <laughs> that's 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 about right. Um, uh, I would I would I would throw a couple. Yeah, uh, apart from that text, which is which is a great one, I would throw in a throw in a couple others. Um, you know, obviously the the text that that I worked on, I'm partial to text called the Revelation of the Magi, which uh, uh, presents the uh, sort of coming of Christ from the perspective of uh, the wise men themselves. Um, but I think the text that, you know, I really sort of fell in love with during the editorial process for this is a, is a text called uh, the, the Dialogue of Jesus with the Paralytic. And it's, uh, it's preserved in um, uh, several obscure languages, including, including Georgian, or it might only be in Georgian. Um, and it presents a Jesus who appears to, in disguise, to um, a paralyzed man who's begging Jesus to heal him. And Jesus is just a first-class jerk in this text. He, um, he essentially just messes with the paralytic for most of the text, saying things like, well, you know, so what did you do wrong to get paralyzed? Obviously, you know, you must have been a bad person or something like that. And then says, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll heal you, but you got to give me a lot of money. And, you know, just... Um, just a really sort of shocking portrayal of Jesus. I think it comes, um, you know, the famous text in, in early Christianity, which is also um, uh, Tony has included in this volume, um, the, uh, the um, Infancy Gospel of Thomas, is well known for it presenting this child Jesus who seems absolutely malevolent. Um, and, but in terms of portrayals of a not-so-nice Jesus, which I tend to gravitate toward because we've always got this assumption of Jesus as this just incredibly sweet, gentle man. Um, he's just an imperious jerk in this text until finally it does have a happy ending and he reveals himself to the, to the paralytic as, as Jesus and then heals him. Um, I think the process began for us about uh, six or seven or so years ago. Um, um, Jim Davila and Richard Balcom were working on their um, more Old Testament pseudopigra project, and um, there was some talk among us in the field about doing something similar for for the Christian apocrypha, but no one was uh, seemed to be really uh, taking up that. So uh, for some reason, I decided to, to to do so, and I asked Brent to 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 join me in working on it, so that we could have this Canadian um, 
uh, US alliance on this project. And uh, I think essentially what we did is we, we uh, um, brainstormed among the two of us about who we know is working on particular texts. And then we would contact those people. Then I think we put out a wider uh, call for um, uh, contributors for people who we just hadn't thought of or, or text we might not have thought of. And that's actually one of the things that happened in the process. Uh, people started telling us about text that we didn't even know about. So, um, um, so that was an interesting part of the process too. And uh, yeah, it was like a fairly long process of uh, having people uh, send us their materials and edited and formatted and so on until we finally got this uh, uh, pretty slick looking uh, collection put together. And I would just add to that that um, one of the things that that uh, happened with Volume One that I think is you know when you're trying to get a massive project like this off off the ground uh, you know this is probably inevitable. But even though we got introduced to texts that we didn't necessarily know um, or weren't super familiar with, most of the people who participated in this volume were sort of in in our network in some way that we. Either Tony knew them, or I knew them, or they were friends of friends. Um, so there was it, um, it, it wasn't it wasn't entirely that participation in the project was just based on you know being being somebody that that we knew, but that was certainly how we created a base. You know, just using our networks. And one of the things that I'm really excited about um, looking looking forward to Volume Two is that now that Volume 1 is in print, uh, there's the opportunity for people that we maybe don't know about uh, in, in the field to take a look at this and say, oh, this looks great. I'd love to do something for Volume 2. And in fact, there was a conference on um, uh, Nag Hammadi and Gnosticism at my institution, UT Austin, last week and had a number of uh, people who were there for that conference that I showed the volume to. And uh, I had not met them previously, and they expressed a lot of interest in, in participating in, in volume two. So I think that looking forward, that's going to be one of the exciting things where we get people to work on you know, even more interesting uh, you know, and, and kind of uh, neglected texts that just aren't on our radar screens at all and weren't really in our original network of people that worked on volume one. I think we need to um, be careful of the distinction between canonical and non-canonical texts when it comes to how these texts were written. So in the first few centuries, people were just writing texts. No one was really certain what would be uh, accepted or not accepted or valued or not valued. Um, but over time, certainly some texts gained a certain amount of popularity. So by the time, so towards the end of the second century, the four gospels found in the New Testament seemed to be fairly widely uh, um, valued. So then after that point you started to get apocryphal writers kind of supplementing that material or, or thinking uh, within its, its narrative world. And part of the thing that uh, Christians found is that some things were not answered by the New Testament, what would become the New Testament Gospels. For example, um, why does uh, Jesus have brothers and sisters if Mary was a virgin? Does it mean that Mary was a virgin after Jesus was born. And so you have a text like the Infancy Gospel of James or the Proto Evangelium of James in which those kinds of questions are answered. Uh, the children end up being Joseph's uh, children from a previous marriage. So they would use text to, to, to answer questions left uh, un, uh, unexplored in, in the, the Gospels that most people were enjoying. But as you get further away from the first few centuries, you get other motivations for writing the texts like establishing festivals or, or uh, sometimes um, just um, uh, throwing mud at, at uh, Christian groups that you don't like. So you would cast them negatively or cast the people that they like negatively in your text. Um, so the, the reasons for writing these things uh, vary quite considerably over time. So it, yeah, in terms of the question of why people um, uh, in, in the contemporary world are fascinated with these texts, um, a couple different reasons, and I would, and I here I'll make sort of a distinction between the reason that scholars are fascinated with them and the reason why uh, why lay people or a popular audience uh, would be fascinated with them. Um, with the lay people, I think that 
you know, a lot of the sort of interest in this derives from the very same motivations that early Christians had that Tony was just talking about for why this literature was, was produced, um, that lots of Christians are just curious about why, you know, what's, what's going on during, you know, Jesus's childhood, or what did the resurrection really look like when it took place? Or, you know, what were the apostles doing on all their travels and journeys? So, you know, there's a lot of narrative gaps in the New Testament that I think if, you know, for those Christians who spend a lot of time reading the Bible and thinking about these narratives, um, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Um, you know, to return to Dan Brown, there's also the, I guess what I would call the conspiratorial angle, uh, the in interest in the idea that there are sort of hidden teachings in, in the writings and uh, things that uh, you're, you're not going to find in the New Testament. And, and that is certainly true to, to some extent. I, I, I wouldn't want to push the sort of, I wouldn't want to say that these texts are, you know, just fundamentally weirder than the New Testament texts uh, in, in, you know, any sort of absolute sense. I think it's, I think it's a relative term. Um, but certainly the, the sort of esoteric hidden nature of it, um, that, that certainly plays a role. Uh, in terms of why scholars are interested in it, why I'm interested in it, I think that, you know, most people get into biblical studies and get into academia because they want to, uh, you know, study new questions, new ways of looking at things, and in the field of biblical studies and early Christi Christian studies, uh, you know, one of the best ways, one of the most constructive ways to, to make those contributions is to work on the apocryphal texts because in terms of, um, you know, articles on apocryphal texts, commentaries on apocryphal texts, um, they lag far, far behind in terms of uh, their canonical counterparts. And so there remains so much, you know, kind of interesting and necessary work to be done with that, uh, with these texts. I don't want to say that we don't need any more commentaries, say for example on the Gospel of Mark, but we could sure use a lot more commentaries on the Gospel of Thomas than we currently have.